You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm Victor, and joining me is William Gallagher. Hello. That was really good. You're being fast this time because we've got a great interview to get to, haven't we? I, I can't, I can't wait. wait. Can this. you wait? I can't wait. Well, I, I was in it, so I heard it, but I'd like to hear it again, actually. It's one of those, there's lots of detail in it, and I know I'm going to go, ooh, in the middle of it, even though I probably did. You're probably going to hear me go, <laughs> ooh, in my head. I'll be going, ooh. But again. never mind all that. Never mind all that. You're keeping people from listening to the interview. I am. Yes. Let's right. get Ready? to the interview. Welcome to this segment of the Apple Insider Podcast. Today, William and I are joined by Neil Barham, CEO and founder of Filmic Inc. So, Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hello. Yeah, pleasure to be here. So Can... uh, how long has Filmic Pro as an application been around? Um, since May of 2011. And, and what, what led you to build it? Why, why does it exist? Um, I guess that's a two-part answer. Um, the simplest would be the advent of the iPhone 4 in the summer of 2010, which was the first smartphone to shoot 720p HD, and I think um, kind of gave us an inkling of the future. Um, and then the second component would probably be somewhat my experience at the Vancouver Film School, where I guess I was sort of hoping to be, uh, you know, Hollywood auteur like everybody else uh, who attends uh, film school. And it was a compressed one-year program. And there were two cameras in the course, a Bolex and a e Claire. Um, and there were four projects shot over the course of a one-year program. So basically there were four people who got a chance to shoot a project or direct it and four people who got to be a DP on a project and then the rest of us in the class um where are you key grips first ads that sort of thing um which was certainly a great way to extend our knowledge base but i ended up graduating from film school without ever getting the opportunity to make a film um which never sat well with me um and i think was uh part of the motivation for filmic pro um a product that would let anybody uh, make as many films as they want and accelerate their learning curve and mimic the functionality that they would potentially end up using on a much more expensive camera as their career progresses. And, and that's interesting that you bring up film school because one of the quotes that sticks with me is Kevin Smith, the, uh, the, the director, said once, skip film school, don't even go to film school, just take your phone, write a script and start shooting it. And I, that's that's kind of where I think Filmic Pro is, is incredible, is that it really enables anyone to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that maybe Steven Soderbergh said a similar quote that, you know, he would have given anything to have this product mm. um, or the ability to shoot on smartphones when he was uh, a youth as well. Um, and I think it does do exactly that. I'm not sure... It arbitrarily negates uh, the value of film school. I certainly think there's a lot of background information to the language of cinema um, that people can accelerate your learning uh, for school. But certainly it's a great companion piece or a prelude to um, anybody's tenure at film school. So, so, so who is the target user? Well, I think very initially it was broadcast professionals and then uh, aspirants, I guess, people who wanted to be broadcast professionals. Um, and it certainly had a focus on the cinema or the movie industry. But one of the unintended developments, I guess, of Filmic Pro's life cycle in the marketplace has been that it's been adopted by a lot of people that we didn't actually seek out as customers. And one great example would be journalists um, have certainly transitioned to shooting a lot of content on their smartphone, more readily available. A lot, the value of video across social media channels 
has meant that a lot of news organizations are telling people who were journalists in print and text before to transition to rich media uh, reporters. Um, Filmic Pro makes a great cost-effective way for somebody who's always written their stories in the past um, to transition to documenting their stories in video. Um, certainly schools, education um, organizations, both at the educator, teacher, professor level, and the students themselves have adopted the app in exactly, I guess, kind of the context that I wish I'd had the option to uh, take advantage of uh, a while back. Um, and then all sorts of small business vloggers um, have picked up the app as well, just for its control over focus and exposure. Um, so all of that's been really rewarding, but certainly the primary focus at the outset was uh, low budget independent film um, production. And, and we've seen a bunch of different things shot with it over the years. There was a, a Bentley commercial that was shot with it. Um, Steven Soderbergh has shot a few things with it. What, what has that experience been like for you? Uh, rewarding, um, for sure. Certainly the Bentley spot was, I think, our uh, first or second primary um, critical validation i guess the other one was uh the zakuda revenge of the great camera sh shootout um and i think both of those were 2012 i might be off by a year um and in the case of the revenge of the great camera shootout filmic pro on an iphone 4s went up against reds aries <laughs> uh Sony's Canon C300 uh, and a handful of other cameras. And the beauty of it was is that it was a blind audience test. So nobody knew what footage they were looking at as they were voting on it. Um, and in that particular test, the Filmic Pro iPhone combination bested the $5,000 Sony FS100 and tied the $13,000 Canon C300, at least those were the price points at the time. Uh, so that was incredible and showed people that it could definitely, I don't know, hang around and uh, be worthy of generating um, credible content. And then certainly the fact that a brand as, um, I guess, high end as Bentley chose to use it for a um, social media ad that certainly went viral is one of the best early examples of iPhone video um, was another validation in and of itself. And the ad ended up being um, finished in black and white, looked gorgeous. Certainly Bentley poured a lot of money into the production of it. So it wasn't quite the same thing that somebody just pulling the phone out of their back pocket would be able to recreate but it showed that if you paid um, careful attention to what you were doing, that you could get professional broadcast quality results, which was our supposition from the start. So that was hugely uh, rewarding. And I think that that's, those two things were maybe the inkling that gave people like Sean Baker and other early adopters, Ricky Foshan would be another, um, the confidence that they could potentially undertake a low-budget independent feature film on a smartphone and film it pro and get credible results. Great. William, what would you like to ask? Oh, where do I start? Listen, uh, I've got to say, I am a fan. I've been using it for a week, uh, shooting it around the Lake District, and I wish I'd had it a few weeks ago with my last project. In fact, I'm considering reshooting to make it look better. But when I first got it and I opened it up, I wasn't expecting it to be, um, to give me any different results. I mean, you're still using Apple's own camera. How is it that a third party app can get better results out of Apple's own hardware? What are you doing that they're not? Well, the, that's actually an organic process that changes every year. Um, I would say 
Apple pretty much has a long tradition of seeding third-party developers with the opportunity to have early access to APIs, and then they assess what options work well in a third-party app ecosystem, and then incorporate some of those features back into their own camera. So at the earliest outset in 2011, the key differentiators for Filmic Pro were the ability to shoot 24 frames per second and the ability to lock focus and exposure. Well, certainly subsequently over the years, those are two things that Apple has added to the native camera app. But if people remember back to 2011, you would get pulsating focus uh, Mm -hmm. as the autofocus would try to read the scene. And so it would seem like the lens was breathing. Um, And that would be something that would basically invalidate any take that a filmmaker was trying to do. Similarly, with actually white balance uh, fluctuations. Um, And then, of course, the better motion effects that you get for shooting at 24 frames per second versus 30 frames a second. Then a little while later, we added uh, our extreme uh, bitrate uh, codecs to the application. So people like the Bentley ad that want to do extensive color grading in post would have up to 100 megabits a second, or now that's expanded up to 140 megabits a second for data-rich uh, information that's going to hold up um, under various color grading uh, processes in post much better. Um, we've added things that people would expect to find on a high-end camera, like the ability to do smooth variable speed focus pulls. Um, So, I mean, it can get as granular as you want. We also support um, third-party anamorphic adapters or anamorphic lenses. So if you want to shoot in a 240 to one aspect ratio, you make use of the entire 4.3 sensor. Um, That's one of the beauties of the anamorphic adapters. So you can essentially simulate what was a $50,000 to $70,000 uh, lens add on to a 35 millimeter film camera for $159 plus the cost of the application. So, for under $200, you can be shooting widescreen anamorphic that's actually held up in 40 foot theatrical screens around the world and has some of the same beautiful uh, lens optics flares um, that you can't get obviously, on the uh, lenses that are on the iPhone. So Filmic Pro does a lot of third-party product integration and support, um, I guess, as the iPhones continue to get better. Um, Then we've certainly branched out into the broader ecosystem of what makes for um, the best high-end filmmaking experience. So in addition to the anamorphic uh, lens support. We certainly do a lot of third-party gimbal supports, Osmo Mobile 1, Osmo Mobile 2, uh, Zion Smooth 4, um, some audio support with outfits like Sennheiser. Um, So we're always looking further down the road for um, how we can give the best end-user experience to uh, filmmakers around the world. That's really impressive, actually. I, I think the thing I didn't imagine was that you would have access basically to the bare hardware, that you could practically do whatever you need with it, where everything else you do with it. I, it seems to me that um, there have got to be circumstances where someone uh, doesn't need uh, Filmic Pro because Apple's one is adequate enough. I think having now used it, I'll never go back to Apple's one. Where are the kind of outlining cases? Where would you not recommend somebody... Uh, goes for your app. Oh, well, I mean, I've, where the native app is actually not only on uh, iOS, but certainly some of the best flagship native apps on Android. Uh, LG would be one example. Uh, the new Huawei P30 
uh, promises to be exceptional. Um, for the average consumer application, uh, filming your kid playing, say, a soccer game, I mean, there are a lot of things that the native apps do even better than Filmic Pro does when it comes to speed, convenience, simplicity, um, ease of use. Uh, so actually, I think Sean, Sean Baker said it uh, best, you know, if I'm shooting a film, I'm using Filmic Pro. If I'm filming my, you know, uh, dogs playing around on the living room carpet, then I'm using the native app. And I would think that that's... Uh, pretty decent split i realized actually until you said it i forgot that you are also on android uh is it feature parity on both and is that easy enough to do um could you repeat that actually had a notification that compressed the uh audio during that question sure i until you actually said it i didn't i'd forgotten that uh, filmic pro is on iphone and android uh is it uh feature compatible is it exactly the same could I shoot with both cameras on a shoot and not know the difference when I got the end result? The best uh, high-end Android flagship devices offer an almost identical experience. The color profile of the natural um, gamma curves that, say, Samsung and Apple provide are going to be quite a bit different. So if you're actually interested in matching shots per se, um, that wouldn't be the, the best option. <laughs> but if you're certainly choosing on whether to shoot on, say, an iPhone XS Max or a Samsung Galaxy S10, you would have almost identical feature sets on both devices and you'd be in a position to get fantastic um, top shelf results. And actually that's been one of the things that um, we've really been gratified over the last uh, year or two is that there's starting to be many more high profile projects shot on Android and Filmic Pro than there used to be. It took many years for us to finally get the Android side of the Filmic Pro house caught up to iOS for feature parity. Um, but, but we're there on the best handset. And the thing with Android, as any third-party developer will tell you, it still remains a decade in uh, the Wild West when it comes to supporting the thousands upon thousands of devices that are out there. And as probably some of your listeners will know, even though it's an Apple Insider program, um, there are plenty of Android devices that Filmic Pro doesn't run on. Um, so we're dependent on something called the Camera 2 API, which offer, enables us to offer all of our manual control configurations. Um, and older or cheaper Android devices only have the Camera 1 API device that doesn't even support that. So Filmic Pro isn't available on Camera One Android devices. So Apple certainly offers a much better closed ecosystem for a third party developer to work in. And so we're always thrilled to develop, iterate on iOS, and then transition the best of our ideas over to Android. You mentioned manual settings there, and I realized one of the things I really liked was when I had slogged through figuring out all the settings. Uh, you make it very easy to save uh, collections as presets. So once I found that, I was very happy with it. But on the way, you do ha I think it's quite difficult to learn how to use Filmic Pro if you're coming to it as I was from just the native camera. Do you have any issues with um, educating people to get them the most out of it or appreciate what you can do? Oh, I would say absolutely. I think that that's in a great area of growth opportunity for Filmic. Certainly in the early years with our initial target audience, um, I think we were presupposing that the people that we were trying to attract would already know the feature sets that we were offering from 
higher end expensive cameras that they were used to using. So in the very earliest years, we almost, I guess, sounds foolish to say, but considered it a sort of like a badge of honor, not having uh, education materials. But as the app became more popular and got more visibility, it certainly pulled more people into its orbit that hadn't necessarily been to film school or weren't working professionals. Um, and so uh, over the years, we've done everything from, I think, like a 45-page user manual that explains all of the functionality within the app and probably nobody wants to read. Hey, I read that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we have roughly about 20, 25, five um, tutorials that average anywhere from, say, two to ten minutes um, that break down all of the functionality within the app as well. And I think that that's been a significant improvement, but I still think that that's um, an imperfect solution and that there are a lot of people that would like to be up and running uh, much sooner. So at this juncture where... Um, nearing the end of, I guess, the current version six um, life cycle and in the midst of development on the next major iteration of the app, which will be V7. And I think um, your question is one of the primary focuses of how we can improve the app in the next generation and whether it's through better onboarding or through actually um, some modification to the user experience um, itself that will ultimately let people open the app and begin using it uh, sooner and getting the results that they want. Oddly enough, you it's designed at the moment to basically be um, usable right out of the box. Like you can essentially open up Tilt Macro after installing it off the App Store, um, hit record, and you should get great results, especially once you start uh, handling focus and exposure with the uh, reticle system. Um, and then the settings are intended as something to only adjust if you know what and why you're making an adjustment. But as we learned, I guess, the hard way, um, you know, part of the app experience is for any app is basically just going in, pressing the buttons and figuring out uh, yes. what the app does. And actually Filmic Pro in that respect can get people into a lot of trouble if they don't know what they're pressing and why they're pressing it. And if they do that with multiple buttons in a row, uh, they can end up compromising their recording in a way that they didn't intend. So one of the most valuable things that we offer in the preset uh, part of the app is the ability to uh, return to your default settings, um, which is a valuable uh, bailout for people who get themselves into uh, a bad way by configuring too many settings. Uh, this is really picky, but it's the last thing I want to ask. I'm just terribly curious. Uh, you have an option. By default, recordings in Filmic Pro are kept in Filmic Pro. You do have the option to save it to the camera roll either as well or instead. I'm not sure which. Uh, what's the benefit of either way? So there are two benefits to saving to the camera roll. I mean, I'm sorry, saving to the Filmic library. And I suppose there's one or two benefits to saving to the camera roll. We recommend that people save the Filmic library because... In that, within the app, we can potentially track down any issue that's related to uh, recording. Once an app exits, or once a clip exits our app and transfers to the camera roll, it's out of our ecosystem and we lose the ability to track it. Secondly, the camera roll is designed basically for the Apple native lenses. So there are certain uh, resolutions that you will get when using one of the anamorphic adapters that makes the ability to save a clip to the camera roll impossible. The camera roll won't recognize the aspect ratio of the 
modified anamorphic uh, resolution. So consequently, that makes it an essential element to be able to shoot, if that's your artistic intent, uh, to save directly to the Filmic library. Certainly, because Filmic Pro is a dedicated uh, capture app, I think there is some misconception. Some people think that it is an editor as well. It really isn't. It does offer some ability to do some like uh, light image adjustment, but you can't do multi-clip uh, editing transitions, uh, audio adjustment in the app. So if you're going to do that on a mobile platform, which is another area we've seen the market change a lot over the last five or six years, then you're going to want to access it from the camera roll. So for journalists especially, uh, where they might want to add text overlays before they go to social media, um, and they're much less likely to shoot with an anamorphic adapter, um, then saving to the camera roll is potentially preferable because it just expedites the whole process as soon as they open up uh, LumaFusion or Kinemaster or iMovie, um, they're going to see their clips right in the camera roll as well. Though iOS 13 is certainly making the ability for other apps to access the files in Filmic Pro a lot easier. So that will become um, less of a hurdle. Right. Well, that's it. I'm off to reshoot everything I've ever shot, basically. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Neil. And and people should check it out at Filmic Pro on the App Store. And uh, what is the URL? Uh, www.filmicpro.com. Fantastic. Thank you again. Thanks, yeah, man. thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Appreciate this. Are you tied down at work? Don't let your software search kill those summer vibes. Now you can ditch the office overtime and find options for your business in minutes with Captera. You can read hundreds of thousands of reviews and make finding the right software for your business a breeze at captera.com slash Apple Insider. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business with over 950,000 reviews of products from real software users. Discover everything you need to make an informed decision. Search more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing to yoga studio management software. And no matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. Visit captera.com slash Apple Insider for free today to find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. captera.com slash Apple Insider. Captera, that's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash Apple Insider. Captera, software selection simplified. And actually, I'm going to go use Captera right now because I need to find software in order to write invoices to invoice people. Oh, let me know what you get. I have my own bespoke um, cobbled together. Yeah, you've been, be using, nice uh, you've been using a combination of Siri shortcuts and other stuff to pull that off. Keyboard Siri Maestro and so on. Pages. Keyboard Maestro, Hazel. Um, it's like a bit of st a string can thing. So yeah, I'm really strings and sealing works, wax all mashed together I, there. When I had to change a client's name recently, it was a bit of a bugger trying to go back in and undo it. So let me know what you find, would you? Oh, I had a lovely one. I had a lovely one, but they've just imposed some weird restrictions on what I can do and not do with it. And so it is time to search again. Okay. Captera.com. That's where I'll be going. Awesome. Yes, recording away. Yeah. Hey, William. Yes. Why do I get wary the second you open your mouth? <laughs> hey, yeah, hey, William. <laughs> yes. We Come get on reader. Down. We get reader email. Did you know it? Uh, as a principal, yes, I get nice emails. So it's really good and interesting. But what's the but? There's a but. There's no but. So. We, we got an email from a fellow named Paul, and Paul was very kind and wrote in a few times, and he wanted to let us know that he listens to the Apple Insider podcast and really is enjoying it with you, Great. William. All right. Oh, cool. Thanks, Paul. He would have written in sooner, but he didn't have anything to add. So he wants us to know just how great we're doing, which is nice, and that we should keep doing exactly what we do. 
well, we could have a go at that. Yes. Uh, every single thing that we do, like all the times you make me wary, for example, we, yes. we could continue doing that. Okay. But additionally, well, it would be cool if we sometimes touched on Apple's medical research programs. Okay. Funny enough, I actually read a lot. Uh, in my work at Apple Insider, I read a lot about the medical stuff because I'm trying to keep up with what's happening. I'm not currently working on anything for it, but I'm terribly interested in the area. And I think you know a huge amount about it, don't you? Oh, you put the finger on me there. I was going to point at you. So I think <laughs> there are a number of different things going on. And I, I think that you know, we know that they have a research lab. We know that they've conducted research on physical performance, just not in terms of only in terms of workouts, but also in terms of medical effects. We know that they're working on the ECG functionality that we've for a long time discussed things like diabetes and insulin monitoring. We, we've discussed all kinds of things, blood sugar monitoring. And I think all of those projects and more are going on actively at Apple's well, health labs. Those doctors, haven't they? I can't remember how Over many. Over 50 some. Mm, yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. separately, so this is, this is interesting, besides all of the research going into things there, they also have a medical clinic. Like they were hiring nurses and doctors and, and physician's assistants kind of thing. Yeah, but people did keep walking into the walls at Apple Park. So yeah, you yeah, know, it exactly. didn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a concussion from walking into the glass at Apple Park. Yes, go see the doctors on staff. Yeah. But, you know, one, one thought was that this was just for Apple employees. And of course, that's how it starts. But another thought was what if Apple actually had... Apple Health Centers all over the place. Oh, grief. Okay. Like uh, You could actually see that happening, yes. Wow. I mean, instead of trying to get an appointment at your Genius Bar, what if you had to get an appointment at your Health Practitioner's Bar? Yeah, I've had mixed results with the Genius Bar, though. So, you know, I I'm about going to see a medical examiner there. What if they say that, I don't know, my pacemaker isn't provided by Apple, consult your dealer? No, 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 something. not even that. It's just, uh, we're very sorry. We haven't made that model for 10 years. It's now obsolete. <laughs> but I have an ADB mouse right here. Why won't it work? Because, yeah, it's and, and the list of hardware that's obsolete goes on. But, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the thing that I like to think about is, you know, people talk about Apple Health being a focus, and it absolutely is. But so is Apple Car, whether it's on again, off again, or how far it's going and all of those problems, or just the phone or the services. There are so many different things, and it's such a massive array of, of things to try and work on. Mm. Where they're really looking, I feel, I don't have any inside knowledge on this one, this is just my feeling, is that they're, they're really looking at where are areas that they can improve someone's life. and uh, Other than lowering the price of MacBook Pros, because that would but, radically but, but improve But William... Mine. If you put it on your Apple card, you get 3% cash back. So you've essentially gotten the stand for the monitor for free. Right. And the interest I pay? <laughs> Can't help you there. But no, uh, Well, you could, but yeah, clearly <laughs> you won't. And neither will they. Yeah. So. So, so there are a ton of things that they have their hands in. And I think that it's not about... Are they going to make their money back on that research? That's a longer-term solution. That's a longer-term question. I think that it's, are they able to improve people's lives? You know, the Apple Watch has been, quote-unquote, saving people's lives for years by reporting that they have AFib or that they have an irregular heart rate and they need to go in and get seen. And people, lo and behold, find out that they really have a problem that needs to be addressed. We don't hear a lot about false positives. We hear a lot about positives. And... Mm. I think if there was a high false positive rate that we might hear more about it. Well, before much of Apple you know, health stuff came out, there were scare stories. That, right, right. There were tons of doctors who were afraid that they were going to be flooded with people with false positives taking up all their time. And it doesn't yeah. seem as if that's actually happened. No, good point. I'd actually forgotten about it because there's been no reporting. So, yeah, that's a... Good thing. I, I am I'm slightly hesitant here because at this very moment I know the entirety of Apple is actually focused on my current activity uh competition 
with Malcolm Aaron on Apple Insider, uh, which he is going to win. I was going to say, today. you are going to yeah. win that without question. No, he's on 2,727-somethings, and I'm on 1,933. I don't even know what they are. I just know I can't get them. <sighs> yeah. Now, I didn't I... work out, and his number went up. This is what needs to be dealt with. This is what's going on. Yeah. Now, speaking of all these other areas that Apple's got their fingers in, Paul also asks, do you think TV Plus will be successful competing with Netflix and others? His feeling is that they entered the content streaming market late, so they have a lot of work to do to push through before they can make serious revenue. And he, he thinks it, along with News Plus and Apple Arcade, are helpful, important platforms for each market to live on. Um, but but he's concerned that it's just late. Well, I, I share the concern, but it's weird. When, he, when Paul asks it that quite that way, I think, actually, Apple's always late everything yes and then they come in and do it better right i mean i had this discussion sure. with a marketing person and and this marketing person insisted that first mover was powerful that first mover was the best position to be in that if you were first to market you won and and i said hang on a minute but that that hasn't worked out historically Historically, mm. first mover comes in and sets the stage for there to be a thing, moves the window, so as it were, into to being this is now a thing. And then second mover comes in, shows how it can really be done, and wins it. Seems unfair, really, doesn't it? But, well, I mean, yeah. this is the problem, is that if you, if you do something first and don't keep shipping and don't keep iterating and don't keep innovating, then it's easy to get left behind. For example, if Netflix had stayed shipping DVDs, Hmm. Then yes, we wouldn't know them. They wouldn't exist. Yeah. Today. And and uh, if you remember, they actually had tried to separate it and keep Netflix as the the streaming business and rename the DVD shipping business Quickster. Yes, I'd forgotten the name, but I remember the moves uh, for it. But and I might even have that backwards. It might have been Quickster that was the streaming business and Netflix was the DVD. But it doesn't even matter because the result is we know what happened. Right? Shipping yes. DVDs around became very stupid and dumb and went away. Yes. I was so into DVD, and now I can't remember the last time I bought one. Yeah. Although I'm looking at the shelves. Or played I one, for that matter, looking good. at the shelves. You ought to dust those, you know. And Well, actually, yes. That's <laughs> very personal for you, but accurate. <laughs> Thanks. <sighs> Sorry. Now, do I think TV Plus will be successful? There's a ton of services out there, and and you can put them on a, a, a timeline. You can put them on a spectrum, right? And you can say that there's your Hulu and your Netflix and your Amazon Prime. Let's let's call those out as being currently the most successful. Okay, is that right? I mean, I know only of Hulu because of uh, Veronica Yeah, I, I know, I know. Things. But at the so other end, I'm going to name some. I don't know some... how it compares. So yeah. at the other end, let's talk about like Go90 or Crunchy. Wow, never heard of those at right. all. Is that just because I'm not in the States? Are they well-known there? Uh, well, I mean, I think Crunchy is an anime-focused streaming service, and Go90, I forget what it was even about, and there's Sony's Crackle that's in there somewhere. Yeah. And and they're, they're definitely swimming at the shallow end of the pool, let's say. Right. Oh, and Disney just announced. Right, they're, so they're Disney gonna... announced oh. theirs. Disney and ESPN and Hulu Plus are going to bundle so instead of paying eleven ninety nine or five ninety nine for Hulu, you can bundle them all and get your Disney Plus, your ESPNs, and Hulu Plus for one price of about twelve bucks. That sounds pretty good if you're into what they have. Well, that's always the case, isn't it? It's uh, well, so that's what like we saw, right? Was this was th th we had these cable and satellite networks, and you you happened to get a channel that you didn't care about like SoapNet along with a channel you might care about like Discovery and that was just it you bought the bundle and maybe SoapNet found an audience and maybe it didn't and maybe Discovery found an audience and maybe it didn't and that was mm. the shot that Disney was taking or that that these companies were taking on these bundles was that they were going to put some things in there that might not work and some things that would and they'd make it all back on the ones that did well, and yes, so we're sort of seeing the rebundling of streaming with Disney's approach to this. Uh, it's it's going to be something to watch. I think 
that Netflix is poised to remain, although they there is some question because there are tons of people that are upset about the idea they're focusing only on originals and giving up licenses like The Office and Friends and things like that. Uh, that's that's a problem Apple has, is we know that they have originals. What else do they have? We don't know. This is Hulu's problem, right? Hulu focused on things. And what did Hulu have? Hulu had The Handmaid's Tale, which is going to get a fourth season. Excellent. Wonderful. What else have they got? I can't think of one. I don't know what else they're doing. Well, Veronica Mars, but uh, I didn't realize Handmaid's Tale was theirs. I had it in my head. It was Amazon. So it's uh, the shows aren't necessarily giving the network's identity. I mean, a worry I have with Apple is that when they launched all their shows, uh, it was exactly like one of the upfront presentations that every network has done for decades. And the question is, what's next? Like they've released a lot of shows, but they're not actually that many hours of television. They've got to keep coming up with this stuff. Um, and we're slowly seeing that they are, but only very slowly. I think over the long haul, yeah, they need originals to get attention. They need the library stuff that's becoming increasingly important, like a banker for it. We'll have to wait and see, but uh, I'm at the moment, I'm, I'm already a bit jaded with the idea of having to pick one of these, and we'll probably just stick with Netflix because it's on my Apple TV already. So, Apple TV Plus, yes or no? You think it succeeds or not? I want it to succeed. I, In the long run... I think it will do well, but I think it will take a, t- a long time. What about you? I I think the timeline matters here. I think you're right, but I think I've been impressed with what we've seen so far. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, I, for I, all mankind. I canceled my uh, my Hulu subscription the other night over dinner, so that that went away from me. But, was that a bad dinner or as was it a topic of cup? Why, why over dinner in between one forkful? You thought, I'm going to cancel Hulu. It was completely in, informed by why am I paying for this? There's precisely one show that I care to watch on it and no one else in the family is watching it. And so mm-hmm. what what is the meaning of this? Why do I need it? I can tell you that it's a very different situation here. But in the UK recently, um, we went through a, a, a big changeover of, of do we stay with Sky Satellite, where it was giving us some problems, do we stay with Sky, all sorts of things that run on. In the end, spent a lot of time, made a move, and uh, it was worth it. I just I don't want to go through it again, but it's worth it. I've actually saved money and got better broadband and all of the channels I wanted. So yeah. for a bit of work that was very, very tedious, it was worth it in the end. Yeah, and but, you know, I was looking and someone had compiled – a list of what's popular to watch in the UK. Oh, yeah? And as I was looking That's... through this list, almost all of the top 10 were US shows. Uh, okay. okay, I would question just, that. Just, just let me cite some of them. Friends, okay. US. The Office, US version. The Good Place. And okay, let me stop you there. Nope. The Good Place solely as on netflix it's a wonderful show but it's not networked here the office us i was looking at either. what's being viewed in the uk what's popular yeah, to watch there is no um, possible chance that and, uh, a show on netflix is going to get more viewers than somebody watching itv or bbc one for example uh, i mean it gets great audiences and i love the good place but it's a finite audience compared to terrestrial so that those figures cannot be correct hmm, interesting um, the Grand Tour, uh, also known as Top Gear, the real one, also made it in that list. Yeah, the Grand Tour. You don't believe I a lot of people that. subscribe to Prime just to watch that? Uh, I I loathe the show. I know that you do. I'm not talking about the quality of the presenters uh, or, or, or even their moral fiber or lack thereof. I'm, I'm talking about, do you think a bunch of people subscribe to Prime just to watch it? Yes, but I think I know them all. So, uh, again, <laughs> you know, limited audience. This year, I find this really difficult. It used to be that I didn't care what channel something was on. I was only interested in uh, uh, the, the show. Uh, a show was more important to me than whatever it aired on. And now, I, because you don't have the freedom to just change channels and say things, you've got to make decisions about channels or bundles. And it's altering how I watch things. But ultimately, it means I'm actually watching less. Um, which surprises me. 
but that is good for your noggin. That is, is good. It? it is good for the old brain pan. Yeah. Okay. Right. Are you sure? I mean, I'm a writer. I, I work with people who write television. Am I just agreeing? Are we are we insulting all of the people I work with here? And Only the noggins? ones who write garbage. The ones who are writing good stuff are the ones you're watching. Next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well thrown back at me. Okay. <laughs> I do honestly remember a time when I first realized that television was not just this thing that ran in the corner that was, you know, emptiness, um, that it was crafted and really well constructed. And th that actually changed. I became a writer because of some of the things I was watching. So I'm very pro television. I won't knock it as a, as a medium, but um, give me an individual show and I might be more brutal about it. Yes. You just were. Yes. <laughs> you literally oh. just were. You didn't like the car show. No, that's a good point. But there you go. So, you know, I'm consistent in there all of this. There you are. There you Where are. Where are we going? How far are we are going away from the days when Apple was the one that made Max, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It absolutely. It's great. Love it. it. William, where can people find you on the internet? Oh. Clearly, I'll be racing to capture to get there before you. Uh, other than that, I'm on Twitter as W Gallagher and email at William at AppleInsider.com. And you? I am V Marks on Twitter. I am Victor at AppleInsider.com. And I want to thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for writing in. It is really our pleasure. We're so glad you were here. We'll see you next week. Bye. Do you need to record an open? <laughs>